Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. All right. Well, welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am Kamal Murray, your new host. And we've got the great, the legendary Billie Jean King here. Um, Billy, thanks for hey, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks, thanks, Kamal. It's great. I'm very happy, and I'm glad that they put you to work. And I can't tell you, I've I've enjoyed your commentary on Tennis Channel when I've heard it, which is great. And uh, we've known each other a long time now, so it's good. And uh, anyway, thank you for all you've done for tennis too, especially in South Chicago with XS, and and it's really great. And I, you know, I was thinking the other day uh, before Tennis Channel. And before all the tournaments they have now, they have a lot more on. And I was just thinking back to the old days. I couldn't even watch Wimbledon or the U.S. I couldn't watch anything um, when we were playing. We couldn't get videos of anything. I'm just thinking how wonderful it is um, that we really have a channel devoted to our sport. And I remember telling, asking Kenny Sullivan. <laughs> I said, does it help if I put every TV on in every room? Would that help? Does that help the ratings? Is that worth four? We have four TVs. Or has it only come out one? You know, and he says, uh, unfortunately, it's a, <laughs> he said, unfortunately, it's only one. So I, I don't know. Anyway, I always think about that. Because, uh, but I turn I turn it on all the time. I know. And that, I mean, 20, you know, I just I put on three TV. I put three TVs up in my family room. So I have. Tennis Channel Plus on one, right. and I have Tennis Channel on the other. And on the big TV, I have Power Rangers because my kids have taken over the TV. So uh, they get the big TV, and I get the two small ones on the side so I can watch. But I know, it's, lately, it's, I've been trying to learn the art. I know, it's amazing. I've and I've like, learned the art of commentating. Well, I know, it take, it's a lot of work. The good ones, the best commentators uh, I found are the best writers. And you'll, you'll notice a lot of times they have writers like John, like John Wertheim. He's, he's a perfect example. He's a great writer and he, you know, they're very, they're usually very good. So I'm always hanging out with them. Uh, they taught me a lot through the years, like Bud Collins and, and, and Frank DeFord and all these different people. Uh, I found really helped me uh, a lot. Mary Carrillo helped me. I mean, you just get a lot of help from a lot of places, but I love the painting uh, behind you with Arthur. It's beautiful. I know. When so, I was growing up, he was my idol. And all of my right. friends played basketball. And so right. the big joke was my nickname was Arthur Trash. <laughs> so you got, they were trash talking you by saying Arthur Trash. <laughs> oh, totally trash talking. Oh, oh, I know. You know, no one from our neighborhood plays tennis. I know. I get it. That's a win for, you know. Right. You need to come to so, the basketball court with us. And so they would be like, oh, yeah, you're Arthur Trash. They knew two players. It was Andre Agassi and Arthur Ashe, which now looking back on it, if you think about how tennis isn't that popular, you know, compared to like baseball and basketball in America, the fact that they even knew of Arthur Ashe was actually a good thing. Well, it's a black culture. So I think they would probably notice. Plus Arthur was such an icon beyond the tennis court. I mean, with, with humanities and just caring. And then obviously with AIDS, HIV AIDS, and then later in his life after... He was outed, really. Um, and I had the, the privilege of working with Arthur for 11 years at HBO. And uh, that helped me become friends with him because we really were not close friends um, earlier on in our careers um, because, well, the guys didn't really care about us, <laughs> to be honest. Especially, I don't know why we didn't, hit, I don't know why we didn't hit with the American guys, but we didn't. I always hit with the Australians. The Australians always said, come and hit. American guys never did, but you're getting back to, we're not that popular. Um, you know, as a sport globally, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, we are, we are number four as people watching our sport. Cricket's ahead of us, um, obviously soccer, but we are number four, even with all of our challenges. The challenge, we really, I just think we miss a lot of things. I mean, of course I come from team sports, Basketball was my first love. My dad was good in basketball, but I just I just feel like our sports um, miss the ocean in, in some ways. I still think 
when you have single elimination, which I like, but you never get to know very many players. You only get to know three or four top men, top women. Uh, and our sport right now has got, it is fantastic. It has so much depth. I mean, it doesn't matter what, I don't care what the players rank. Everybody hits the ball well. Everybody's in it. Anything can happen. Um, but I still say, and I'll always say um, that without a team, like two months a year or something, have a team season with the rest of it, that we're making a big mistake because a lot of kids will get much better known if they play for a team. I mean, the reason you know base, uh, you know, basketball players, baseball players, uh, these team guys, soccer, is because whether the team wins or loses, you get to see them again the next night. But in tennis, with single elimination, you know, 50% are gone the first round. I've, I've said this so many times. You know, I'm going to say, shut up, Billy, but I don't care. 75% are gone after the <laughs> second round. But, you know, 75% of, player, of players are gone after the second round. So how do you expect people to know who we are? And our sport needs men at the top. And we used to be. Another thing we don't have in the U.S. that we used to have when when tennis was explo exploiting, uh, exploding during the 70s is that we used to have about 50, 50 tournaments, 16, I mean, tournaments and team tennis, okay? World team tennis. So we had, and those are the top players playing in all, in all of them uh, with world championship tennis and all these different things that were going on. But we were, and you've got to remember, every time you have a big tournament or a team in a city, they contribute to community tennis. And that's why it's important. They don't, I don't ever want to have a pro tournament or a team or anything in a city without giving back to the community. And that's, that's what all the, all the sports do, whether it's, uh, you know, NFL, whether it's NBA, um, the WNBA is going up, 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 by the way. Um, it seems like it's because, you know, when we were growing up, it seemed like it was black, whites, everybody, but it seems very heavily black now with the culture, I think. Don't you find that the percentage just gone up, up, up? So every kid that's born black, I mean, like you were just saying, the, the basketball guys are giving you a bad time. So it was like, <laughs> you know, I just, I just want every, I want everyone to belong to our sport. And we do have to work at getting people of color, I think we've done a great job with wheelchair tennis with uh, the para athletes. I think we're very good in that area. I think we've done a good job. We can always get better, but I think the ITF has done a great job uh, for people. And we, we do have to be inclusive. It's just so important. And, but people have to see themselves. So if some, somebody um, doesn't look like them, a lot of times they're not going to going to, you know, get into it with them. So it's, I don't know. What do you find? Well, I think that, you know, the opportunity that tennis has is it's the longest season of any sport, right? We play basically 10 months out of the year. We play, I mean, we're like the traveling circus. We go from country right. to country, city to city. But the problem is we don't leave our imprint on that city, right? There's not always a community tie in, a community event. And, you know, quite frankly, the only two people that you get to hear from from a whole week are the person that's holding the trophy right? And the person that's second place. Correct. The other 126 players are like, hi, here today, go, you know, right. pay your hotel bill, go to the next tournament. And so you <laughs> never really get to know the people who finish, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, make it to the quarters. Oh. You can know what to hear from. They only hear from one. And if that one or two person, you know, oh, think, think about it. Like, like, I think, I think 20, 2018, 2019, there were 19 different champions the first 19 weeks on WTA tour. So we only got to hear 19 different people kind of like hold the microphone and get to know them and get to hear what they had to say. You know, it wasn't like a repeat winner who got a chance to like have a message, carry a message on. You only got to hear from one person. So I thought that was good to have so many different winners that, you know, in that type of season. I love but, it. I love but it. But in the normal season, you get like the same people winning and you just only get to know that one person, you know, like a Naomi or like a Barty now, right? You've got these dominant figures that I think do become icons 
Um, but I think, you know, we have a lot of depth and we need to hear. We do. Um, all of those. That's why, I, that's why I always want team. Because if we had a season, I'm not saying be at the same time, but just think if you had leagues in Europe, South America, North America, Asia, okay? Do you know how many jobs we can provide? That's what I care about is jobs as well. And when you have when you create jobs for players, you create jobs for everybody else. There's PR, yeah, agree, there's, agree. Media, there's sales, there's administration, there's physiotherapists, there's athletic trainers. It goes on and on and on. But we are such a great sport. We need to also stop arguing among ourselves because we have to deal with competing with other sports. That's what we need to be concentrating on. And we have very little of the total media. And that's where the money is, is the media. I mean, the NFL just got a hundred billion, yeah, B contract. And they and they and they only play in the United States. Okay. We're a global sport. So we have some advantages because of that, but we don't really have if you ask a person when's the tennis season? They wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to tell them. I'd say all year round, basically, almost all year round. Yeah. But that's not, that's not good. Yeah. Fans don't, fans don't get that. We have to think about the fans. Another thing I was watching the, the, on tennis channel, I was watching the intercollegiate, you know, the NCAA, you know, D1 finals, you know, at the national, at the national, at the USTA national campus in Orlando. And I'm like, it, this format drives me insane. First of all, they put five matches up at once, which is good. I mean, we've got them going at once. <laughs> which one do you Which one do you watch? Don't like it. I like everyone watching everyone at the same time on one court, just like in basketball, football. Why do they win? And we could be the third largest sport in collegiate sports if we had teams with men and women on the team. I don't care about whether it's like world team, team tennis or not. I care that it's both genders, we can promote equality. I've been talking about this for 50 years. The colleges still think they're doing it right. You know, Tim Russell was all excited because he had three doubles playing and the first when the first two get to whatever, six, 10 or whatever, and then the other one stops and that makes the match shorter. I'm like, ay, ay, ay. You know, it's like every, <laughs> every player that plays on a college team, to, I think uh, deserves to be on center court, stadium court, everybody together and then they go well there's not enough players on each team do you know how many schools have dropped tennis i think over 100 have been dropped since covid another 100 i think we're up to probably six or seven hundred colleges that have dropped tennis because we're considered a minor sport and just think if we were the third largest sport in college we would be self-sufficient we would have, we would be promoting equality and inclusion, which is the right thing to do, be on the right side of history and get more kids into the sport because they love college sport. Kids watch college. If you're a good football player, great basketball player or that in college, they can't wait to see where you go on the pros. And we, we haven't developed that. And when you think about it, baseball has about a 700 guys in it. And they only, this is only us, everyone. But there's 700 guys get making a living, and that's a major league. Then you've got your minor leagues, which that gets iffy on whether you can say they're making a true living. But the point is, you've got 700 NFLs about the same, seven, 800 guys. We don't take care of 800 players. They, you, they can't say at the end of the year that they're making good money and they're able to save money uh, and save for retirement and all that. I don't think so. Do you? What do you think? How many players do you think really? make a living 150 no, no. i'd say 100 100 and 150 are making a decent living and those from you know 107 to 150 are barely right they're depending on making it through qualities to get in the slams they're depending on a wild card to the u.s open so i would say those on you know 107 to 150 are still on what i consider welfare which right. is some investor gives them some money to travel yeah. or some food money right or yeah. just kind of takes a chance on them in, in exchange for some tickets so i would say Outside of 106, everyone else is on tennis welfare or borderline unemployed. Right. Right. And just 
maybe avoiding the real world, right? So if you get somebody that's 225 in the world, right? They're just trying to delay entry into the real world, having to get a real job. Because well, they're definitely not making a living. It depends if they have a chance to move up or not. But if you're talking about the hanger honors yeah. that like they're 35 years old, have never got up to the <laughs> so-called majors, or, you know, uh, then, then you got to start thinking, man, I, I better get another job. And every year you play tennis, you're not training for something else. Right. So it's right. hard. Right. Agree. But, but I would like it's to hard. take it. But I've always worried about having more jobs for our sports, for our sport. And we need to have, and also it's hard on the men to get boys because this, look at, you got basketball, you got American football, NFL, you've got baseball, you've got all these sports who are there for boys. There's no girls involved here. And so that, that depletes a lot of men thinking about tennis. And I wish we could go, and I've talked to the USTN and, and everyone's trying the best they can. Everyone's doing a great job is that, I mean, everyone is doing a great job. Everyone's busting their backside. Everyone cares, but we don't have the right formula yet because look, in the U.S. we're not winning. The boys aren't, but I think TFO or TFO, I never feel, know how, how to pronounce it properly. Francis. <laughs> TFO. <laughs> TFO? Yeah, no. TFO. TFO? Okay. TFO. TFO. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Kamal. Now I asked Francis before. I asked Francis before. He told me, and I'm like, I go away and I go, what did he say? You know, like, what did he say? I know. De depending on the day, he gives you a different answer. Whether he oh, like, what, says it emphatically yeah. or he's feeling down or he's laughing while he says it, I get it. I know, I know. But anyway, I like, he's a great guy. I love him. And then I love um, Sebastian Corda. I think he's, those two, those two, I think, I guess they're our best guys, aren't they? I mean, you would know better than I would, but I sure hope that we get going with them. I think there's some Not problems. Shima. Don't forget about Brandon. Brandon good. is a stud. I no, he's good. I had a chance to coach him in world yeah. team tennis. That's right. He's that young. dude can play. That he dude can play. Can play. No, he and he play. loves tennis. And he's committed. And he asks questions. He was the first person, first player that I had walked, to me and walked back to me in the middle of the match and say, where should I serve this next serve? Just in the middle of the match, which was great about team tennis. Tell me what to do. What do you see? Where should I serve the next serve? Rajiv Ram too. I mean, Rajiv Ram played on tour for what, 20 years now. And in a couple of those doubles matches, he's like, what do you see? Where should I serve this next one? Right? Uh, or what do you think the serve is coming? But Brandon Nakashima, when I talk about a kid, ears wide open, mouth shut, asking questions, competing. I mean, man, you just fall in love with that kid. Yeah, yeah, but now it gets, yeah, you got a live one. When they start asking questions, then, then you know you have a live one because they're like, you know, what is it? And I've talked to some coaches, I won't say who, but I go, what did the player ask you? And they said nothing. <laughs> when you get a player that doesn't ask you something, that's not usually a good sign. That's not a good sign. When, when they're really yeah. inquisitive, inquisitive, want to be challenged, help me, you know, and, and just start to, uh, and then, after that match, he, you guys could have discussed, you know, after you decided where you think he should serve. But then you, after, you know, at dinner, you can sit down. Well, OK, let's go over that. But, you know, you came over to ask me, what do you think now? What if you're in a match by yourself? You know, what would you do? Or if you had to do it yourself or, you know, there's ways. you. Can, but that's why coaching is so great. Um, oh, and I, I wish great. That, I would say that was the best three weeks in my tennis life. Really? Um, ever. Was coaching team tennis? I mean, U.S. Open was you got great. To coach. Was great. You got to coach. Yeah, really you got coach. to coach. And right. yeah, you got to, I mean, in an instant, have an impact on the match versus, you know, sending the player on the court wondering, I hope I said it right. I hope the game plan works. I hope we're warmed up enough. I hope all of this. This one, you got a chance to sort of try to have an impact on the match and help the player through it. It was such a good experience and challenging. I mean, you got so many different personalities. You had Jeannie, you had Bethany, you had Sloan, you had Brand, you had <laughs> Rajiv Ram. I was like, those players could not be like so different. Yeah, but right? that's- to try to like get- They are different, together. but that's what makes it fun too. And also I want more coaches. I want more coaches. And I want more women coaches in particular and pe and coaches of color out there uh, coaching uh, because I, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. And I want people to go into coaching and if we, if we make coaching kind of a adjunct to a player up on the stands and, 
you know, and the, then they get accused of signaling, which I don't think it matters. I think we should get rid of all that. Say whatever you want. Give them the, you know, like a first base coach or a third base coach. Who cares? The, half the time the player doesn't hear you. Half the time the player can't do it anyway. It's like, and also it would improve our sport to get more, uh, to get more media content. Because if you look at other sports like football, basketball, coaches get a lot of ink. They get a lot of attention. Yep. And that's another reason we should do it, just to bring more attention to our sport. And for some reason, tennis people go, no, the player has to be on their own. They have to think. And I'm like, you guys, I've done Fed Cup. I'm telling you, I've done other things. I've coached, I've coached champions. I was part-time coach with, with Martina Navratilova. Craig Carden was the full-time coach. I've, I've been coaching forever. I love coaching. But it's like, really? You guys, it doesn't work like the way you think. Most people, fans don't, it doesn't work the way they think, really. So it's, um, but if we can get more attention, more column inches in the old days, we'd say, but more attention, more mm -hmm. social media, uh, more print, more everything, more stories. Um, on coaches, we would get them. I mean, I was looking up and thinking about even black coaches. I was thinking Dr. Johnson, who coached, you know, Althea Gibson, Arthur Ashe. He also coached white kids and, and Asian kids, which I don't think a lot of people know that. Tam O'Shaughnessy used to oh, yeah. play. Tam O'Shaughnessy, who's white, is used to go to his place every summer. And, and uh, Tina Watanabe used to go there. I don't think a lot of people realize that. I think they thought it was all for black kids and this. It's not. And I think people should know that about uh, Dr. Johnson. I mean, he was just an amazing man. And then... Um, was it Sidney Llewellyn? I think I met, did I meet him before he passed? But he helped out there. Um, you know, it, it's just all these these coaches. Uh, there, there's so many. Uh, John Wilkerson, my Lord. Lori McNeil and Zena Willis Garrett. Thomas. McGregor, yeah. Willis, Willis Thomas. McGregor. Willis Thomas. Willis Thomas. And Willis, they talked when he was, he was a, he's adorable. I used to love it when he was around. And, and everybody said he was really good for the, the, for the mind. He really was a better, he loved coaching and helping the mental side. Yeah. And, and Benny Sims, who coached, and uh, he was very good to me. He woke me up, and, and because he woke me up to about, I, I was able uh, with Carol Gravener to get an assistant coach. We had to have the budget with Fed Cup when I was coaching. Uh -huh. And so Zena became my assistant coach. And that was good because um, that way people saw a woman of color coaching. And then she became the captain, the, the, the head coach. Um, so those, those are the things. Um, but there, if you notice, I haven't named one woman of color coach. Okay. Do you know any women of color coaching? Do you know anybody? Zena Garrison. Well, Zena was yeah, well, Zena. My... That's right. Zena's, Zena's coaching right now, probably. Um, she, she initiated She initiated me into this coaching world. But I'll tell you about what you mentioned Willis Thomas. Emily, I Emily Moore. Thomas, I think, like you said. I think there was an Emily Moore. I think she was of color. She, I think she did some coaching, maybe. Yeah. Well, I met, first time I met Willis, very soft-spoken, walks real slow, yes. very sort of discreet. He walks up to me and he says, Zena hired me and fired me four times. <laughs> you're not a real coach until you get fired. He's, until you get fired, you're not a real coach. <laughs> so, so, so every time I split with a player, he calls, he says, now you're a real coach. <laughs> he said, now you're a real coach. <laughs> and that was the best. So, I mean, Willis, you know, every word he says, you got to hold on to it because it doesn't say that much. But he calls right. you, you know, he calls you and it's, it's in, but you were talking about black coaches. So if you think about Florida and m University, where Althea went. Yep. Right. And they produced three black coaches to coach pro players. So there was no Wadawu, Coach Melanie Udan, like all the way from when she was a child till she was 14. Francis's coach, Zach, went to FAMU and I went to FAMU. And we just lost the men's program at FAMU. So we talk about colleges losing. There we program, go. That's what I'm talking right? about. How can how can FAMU not have a program when Althea Gibson went there? And really the only three or four black coaches in tennis currently, right, went there. And now we don't have the men's program. That's ridiculous. Right. That's so it's it's sort of sad. Yeah, but if we if we were the third largest sport in tennis, I guarantee you you wouldn't have lost your program. We lose our programs. Because we we are considered a minor sport in college, and we depend on football money and money other monies coming from other sports. 
We don't, I don't want that. I want us to be self-sufficient financially. And also, uh, oh, the Florida, they just won. Uh, ben Ch uh, Bill, um, Sheldon. Brian they, Sheldon. Brian Sheldon. Brian and his Sheldon. kid won the match. Ben, he yeah. won the deciding match. I was watching. I was so excited. Yeah. He's a great coach. He was, he's been wonderful. Rodney Harmon, I love. I mean, there's a lot of great coaches. So, uh, But I think coaches are under – Rated, I think we need to make them a big deal in tennis, a huge deal, like they do in other sports. And um, so it's, it's really interesting. Well, let me ask you this. You had the chance to play all the slams, but also coach. I always find that, you know, the French Open is like my favorite. That's right? your favorite? There's enough atmosphere. Oh, yeah. From a coaching standpoint, there's enough atmosphere and attraction and like restaurants to keep your player interested but it's small enough where you can contain it. I feel like the US Open gets out of control. You gotta leave the hotel three hours early because you might hit traffic. Then if you don't hit traffic, you're sitting around. People are asking for tickets. I just feel there's a lot. I feel like Wimbledon sometimes is a little sleepy, a little monotonous, very peaceful, right? But sort of like <laughs> can rock your player to sleep a little bit. And Paris is like the perfect sort of like blend happy medium. What? Which was which was your favorite as a player and then as a coach? Oh gosh, things were so different then. Um, I don't think people realize how tennis was so small, thinky, and how huge it became uh, during the '70s. That was our biggest growth. My generation living through that was so exciting. Um, we weren't really worried about the majors the way the kids are today. We we missed the French to play team tennis, the Virginia Slims of San Francisco was during the Australian. I didn't play there for 11 years. Um, we were really concerned with tennis being a professional sport and being avail available to everyone. Um, and the tour was much more important. I'm sorry to say that the players don't really understand why the tour is important anymore. I don't think they do at all. They think about, I just want to win a major. Is it, and, then the, and then the agents make all the contracts around the majors so they can make more money. Instead of kind of thinking about the sport as a whole and thinking about how can we promote it all the time. Um, but as far as the majors, I mean, first of all, we used to play at Kuyong. Uh, in Australia, which is, if you go over there now, which I do yeah. when I'm in Australia, when, you know, before COVID, and I want to go back because we have godchildren there, um, is that it looks so tiny now. It's so cute. It's a beautiful club. <laughs> it's still a beautiful club. Yeah. They keep the courts. Oh my God, it's a beautiful club. So we, I go over there as, to go to a club and I have a wonderful time and have great memories. But then when you go to uh, the, the real Australian now, um, it's just fantastic. Um, another thing people have to remember is that the players have, are a little more rested when they get to Australia. So they're all happy to see each other because they haven't seen each other for a month or two. And there's, it's, it's, it's kind of easier going they're, you know, because they're more rested and they're so happy to see each other. So that's what I felt there. But that one used to be tiny. Now it's, I think they're the most progressive maybe. Uh, the French, uh, the USDA didn't exactly let me go that much. And finally, by the time I went, I think I was number one in the world by the time I went for the first time. And that was terrible. Uh, but it was, I love Paris. Uh, I wish I could speak French. I always say, God, you know, you should really learn. And then, of course, the restaurants, forget it. Those are, you know. Uh, but I love playing. I love playing in Italy. I love it there. Um, I love their food, too. Um, the people are so warm here. <laughs> And they would, you know, throw you up in the air and throw pillows on the court. I like all that. I like noise. I like it when people get into it. I want to, I want our sport to grow. When I, when I'm out playing, I always think about grassroots tennis, coaching the game, how we're going to, how can we grow our sport? I'm always thinking about all these, these things. And, and then of course, when I grew up, the, the ultimate was to win Wimbledon. And, and when I used to read books, or if you didn't win Wimbledon, you could not be number one in the world. OK, we did not have computer mm -hmm. rankings. We didn't have computer rankings. So you had to win Wimbledon to be ranked number one. So that was on a pedestal for me. Um, 
reading about it, read, you know, sleeping with the books like, uh, you know, Doris Hart's book, Tennis with Hart, H-A-R-T, because she was tight with her brother. I'm tight with my brother, the one that plays baseball, Randy, you know, and so, <laughs> and, so uh, and then I used to, when I got Althea's book in 1958, I used to sleep with that and read it. I must have read it 10 times. I've always wanted to be somebody because she was my first, my first real hero or shero in the game because I got to see her at the Los Angeles Tennis Club. And that's when I realized what number one looks like, how good you have to be. I watched everything. I was mesmerized by her. And I, I knew that that's, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. So I saw her, I go, I have to be that good. I'm gonna have to work so hard. So she, just by her presence and watching her play live, changed my whole life. And after that, you know, through the years I got to know her, um, thank God we finally got something at the U.S. Open. I wish we'd done it earlier when, when Althea was still alive. Um, she she paid a huge price. And then, of course, when we when tennis went open in '68, you know, the every every the guys wanted us to go away. It was a terrible time. I thought the guys would never do that. They're my friends, and my former husband Larry said, "No, let's try to." <laughs> So anyway, I've got, you know, my, in my book, I talked about it, but it killed me to talk about it, actually, because I really like these guys, but I had to tell the truth, too, and some uh, different quotes, because you got to set the scene for people, because they really wouldn't understand that today at, at all. They just would go, no way, way. <laughs> so, you yeah. Know. Do you remember the first, the first two times that I came over for dinner? That you came what? That we came went to dinner? Over your house for dinner. I came over your house for dinner. You mean in New York or, or Chicago? Yeah, New York. New York, right. I do. Remember you called. You always have to do your said, laundry. Do during, you always have to do your laundry <laughs> in the open. <laughs> that, that, that was like time number five. So the first time, I think Alana called me, said, come on, we're going to come over for dinner. Uh, do you like fried chicken? I'm like, well, black man doesn't like fried chicken. Of course I like fried chicken. So order the best fried chicken. We got the best fried chicken place down the street from our house. Fried chicken and potato. Okay, perfect. I'm coming over. So then I think it was like three or four months later. I'm in town again. Come out, come over for dinner. She said, did you like that fried chicken from last time? I said, I loved it. Perfect. We'll get that again. So I come over. I thought about the story because we talked about Larry. So I came over. We're sitting at the kitchen table, just talking, whatever, whatever. Alana disappears. I'm kind of like getting hungry. I'm wondering when the food's coming. Alana disappears to the kitchen. I start hearing the microwave. This is before you redid your kitchen. This is the old kitchen, right? So I start hearing the microwave, da 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 Then she comes out. Here's dinner. And I said, this is how I knew we were family, because you fed me some day-old chicken. I said, now no. you know you're family when you invite somebody Is that what we did? For, for I can't believe hours. you do that. Oh, yeah. That's hilarious. Yes. That's when you are, you're right. Leftovers are family. That's true. We do that a lot though with our friends. We don't cook. We're terrible. Except Lana's starting to cook because of COVID. She's starting to get like Brussels sprouts and starting to cook. I'm like, what are you doing? We, we always get takeaway because we try to really support uh, the local restaurants here. The moms and popsy restaurants, small business. We're big on that. Open. Where we get that chicken from? Chirpin chicken. Is it chirpin? Yeah, is it still open? Oh yeah. yeah. Are you kidding? That place has to be. That that place is like a, I don't know, but uh, no, but it's just we got to get. We just have to. I just want our sport to grow so badly. I want men champions as well as the women. I want you know because Serena and Venus have carried us for so long and they've transcended our sports so much. Well, let me ask you about Venus and Serena because you know you played for a long time, but not only did you play, but you carried the whole tour. Right, you were trying to play, you were trying to market and sell, and you're at the player party, entertaining sponsors, et cetera. How did you know when to step away? Because we obviously see Venus and Serena, you know, holding on, they're staying out there. Serena's obviously chasing 24. You know, Venus is just hanging on because she realized how much she loves the sport. We see Kim Kleister's trying to make a comeback. We see Vesnina just had her baby, now she's coming back. Right. How did you know? It was like, you know what? It's time. It's really hard. Go. But, but one thing I want, I think it's really important. I read a, 
what's his name? What's his first name? Brett Bradley played for the Knicks and was a senator. Um, anyway, I read his book and it talked about how you've got to treat your career like a full life and you should do, you should play if you want to play. And I wish I had listened to that. Um, Bill Bradley. How can I forget Bill? <laughs> Billy. Bill. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you know, uh -oh, uh -oh. Uh, so anyway, his book was wonderful because he said it's like a full your career you got to treat like a full lifetime you should decide when you don't want to play because if you still love to play that's good enough and i wish i quit the first time i quit too early i quit one season too early for singles but i love playing and it was hard to leave it i mean i love to play tennis you know my knees i've had bad knees i mean i didn't you just you know what It'll take care of itself, but I think you should play as long as you want to play. Like if Venus is still happy playing, even though she's losing first, second round play. I, don't, I, think, I think that's the least we can do is let them play as long as they want to. I, I mean, I think they've given a lot. They've played a lot. They've won a lot, but it's okay to lose too. You learn about life. You know, we win some, lose some. It's who can be resilient, who can bounce back in life, you know, champions on and off the court. And tennis sports, sports and tennis really tr uh, teach you those qualities. I mean, the great thing about tennis is that it's a team sport and an individual sport. I mean, I grew up in team sports and I love team sports. I prefer team sports. I prefer doubles over singles. I like mixed doubles the best. You know, Owen Davidson was my guy. He was, oh my gosh. A lot of times he was working some years. So he couldn't, he and I couldn't even play together because of pro tennis and trying to make a living. It was so different than people not even imagine it. So, um, you know, we, when we started the tour with the original nine, and I'm really happy we're going to be inducted this year uh, as a group. You know, there's never been a group inducted at the International Tennis Hall of Fame. We're the first group. Mm. It's always been individuals or a doubles team, but we're the first group. And we are the reason there's professional women's tennis we are the, we're still relevant because when Osaka is up to 55 million, if we hadn't done what we had to do back then when everybody wanted us to go away, believe me, she would not be making even close to 55 million. She might even be the warm up act as an amateur. So um, I'm really proud of what we've done. Rosie Casals, Nancy Ritchie, you guys have to learn these names. Peaches Barkowitz, Judy Dalton, she's Australian. Karen Melville Reed, Chris, you know, Christy Pigeon, but just the nine of us with Gladys Hellman, and of course she was amazing. Um, I talk about it in the book, actually. Um, my the book's coming out in August, uh, all in. Um, yeah. I don't think people realize how important those moments, they don't even know about those moments, first of all, but we do. And so we're thrilled when every time a woman player gets any check at any level tournament, satellite, you know, a 250, a 500, a thousand, I don't care. Uh, we know if we hadn't done what we did, even though we're, we were willing to give up our, our careers. And that's what you have to be willing to do sometimes. You know, you've got to be willing to boycott like the men boycotted in uh, in 73 at Wimbledon. Uh, you you have to be, you've got to, sometimes you just have to take a stand. Um, but I, I know for a fact, the original line, we are responsible for women's professional tennis. Well, let me start, ask you this. The start of the day, we signed a $1 contract with Gladys Hellman. That is the birth of women's professional tennis. Well, I always find it unique because, you know, obviously I know a bunch of my best friends play in the NBA and right. I listen to Charles Barkley every night, right? Oh, he's and, so funny. You know, some of the, he's so funny, right? And he's, he's making tons of money now, but I feel like at a point there was, there was, a point where some of those NBA players were a little bit jealous of the money that the new NBA players are making. You know, you got guys that are like middle of the road guys making eight, nine million bucks. Yeah. But you always were trying to get the ladies more, even after it was not going to benefit you. I mean, 39 grand slams and you made $1.9 million. And now if you lose <laughs> the French Open in the final, you made $1.9 million. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, but I, that's what that was our I dream. Was, I mean, I, I think people have to understand, we talked about this before, we talked about this, the nine of us, we talked about this. And the three things we're willing, we're, is that that any girl born in the world, this is our goal, any girl born in the world, if she's good enough, would have a place to compete. 
because we didn't have that guarantee back then. We didn't know what was going to happen. Number two, to be appreciated for our accomplishments, not only our looks. If you look at the Bobby Riggs match, which people go, what's that? But that's when I played this guy and we had 90 million people watching, <laughs> which is still the most, I think, of any match. I, I don't think there's ever been more than 90 million watching tennis, is there? I don't know. Probably I'd have not. to find out. But we didn't have social media then or anything. So, um, so we wanted to be appreciated for our accomplishments, but when I'm being brought out in that Egyptian litter, Howard Cassell not once talks about my accomplishments, he talks about my looks the whole time. And then Bobby Riggs comes out. It's all about Hall of Famer, Wimbledon this, or, you know, and I'm like, and I didn't listen to, I didn't watch the match for 25 years. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to take a look at the broadcast. When I was being carried out and I heard Car Howard Cosell go on and on about my look, if she do this and she get that, she could be a movie star, she could be this. I'm like, really? This is a tennis mat. This is sports. This is guts. So anyway, um, that was what we wanted to get rid of. We wanted to be appreciated like, just like a guy for Hall of Fame or winning this. And then number three, most importantly, I, we wanted the women to be able to make a living. That was absolutely, but we were willing to give up our careers for that. I don't know if this generation would be willing to give up their career. All I hear them complaining about the ATP. Then you got Djokovic over here. And we need to get together somehow. We need to figure it out because we are the fourth. We we've got we are the fourth most popular sport worldwide as far as people watching, and we only have one point something like three percent of the media money. Okay, so we're number four. People are watching us. We, we're getting we have no money. Whereas you see this hundred billion dollars from the NFL means the players get more. More players can play. More team. I mean. It's about money. And that's why I tell women to follow the money because boys are taught that. But do people don't, I don't think we have to figure our sport out because it's not only about, everyone in tennis is so small-minded, most of us, because we, we're like, oh, we're going to you know, protect our little territory. No, we need to stick together so we can compete against the other sports that are making 100 billion and we're making 1.3% of all that. And so, and we're the fourth largest as far as people watching. So what's wrong with this equation? A lot. So well, our I don't think I don't think the players want the pressure. I think the the what you're talking about, you know, the tide rises all ships. That's pressure, right? So that's pressure to kind of like do your job and take a stand and grow be, something. And I'm not sure they can handle it. Well, then don't be an athlete. Don't be a professional athlete because you know what? We are so blessed. We are so fortunate. We have a platform. Do you know how many people would give anything to have a platform that we have? And look how great the NBA was, the WNBA, you know, the NFL stepped up, baseball even stepped up. I mean, I mean, everyone stepped up and Osaka really stepped up for us. And look what happened. People, you know, black lives do matter. It's like, you guys, everything matters, but come on. It's like being close. Well, let me say this. The first time I walked on Arthur Ashe Stadium, first of all, that is a frightening stadium. I mean, it's it is huge. massive. It's oh big. my goodness, right? So you walk out there and there's a plaque on the wall and it says, pressure is a, a privilege. And I heard you tell a lot of stories, but I don't know where that came from. Was that just it's a privilege? That was something awesome. you came up with? Yes, I came up with it really quickly. I came up with uh, pressure is a privilege and champions adjust or adapt the same, the same time. It was Fed Cup. Uh, Lindsay Davenport, she was getting frustrated. We had a big match against Spain. We're in, uh, I think we're in Ve Las Vegas and she's coming over and she's looking at to me like she had a hard time with the Rancha anyway. So, and she, she can beat her. She just has to concentrate a certain way, but play a certain strategy. And she was getting so frustrated. She said, help me, you know, what, what's, I got to figure something out. And I just looked at her and these two things popped out of my mouth. Champions adjust and pressure's a privilege. Let's go. And she went, oh, I love those. Okay. And she won. It was great. I, I, I don't know where I came from. It was just trying to, to motivate her quickly, you know, because she's such a great player and she's so smart. She's doing a great job at Tennis Channel. She's very observant. I love it. She's really, she's got, very she's smart. got it. No, she's very smart. She's got it. And she's very observant. Another thing we did is when we started the tour, 19th, we started, our first tour was in 71. Gladys Hellman and I talked 
a lot about how we have to have people of color. We have to have women of color. There aren't any out there, we think. So, and of course she was tied with the ATA, the American Tennis Association, which was started in 1916 by basically black doctors, I think, and businessmen, weren't they? I mean, you probably know better than I do, but I think I have it right, yeah. in 1916. Yeah. And so I said, Gladys, we have to have some. I don't know if they're good enough, but we got to do something. And God bless Gladys, she went out, got Bonnie Logan was our first woman. We got, and then we got Ann Coger, and Ann Coger ended up um, being the women's coach at Haverford, I think for 35 years. I think she just retired a couple of years ago. Actually, I'm in touch with her, so I, I know this. And also um, Sylvia Hooks. Those three, and in my book, I have a great photo of the three of them in Philadelphia when they first. Oh God, that's my favorite. I think it's about my favorite photo. I took a great photo out to put that one in because I wanted it so badly. And, uh, and you know, I talked to well, all- that's of interesting because, you know, that's so interesting because for me, the first black woman I ever heard of played tennis was Althea. Sure, well, she was the first. And, and then there was like a gap from my knowledge. From your Althea knowledge. Althea right. and then Zena, right? I didn't learn about Leslie Allen until after I went. Zena was the first African-American woman I saw on television. Right, because, uh, because that's who you saw, but- what about Leslie but Allen? I was like, it's got to be Leslie Allen. I had never heard of her. How about Renee Blount? Wow. Never heard of her and never seen her play. And, and so I asked Zena, I said, Zena, there's got to be somebody between uh, Althea well, and you. And then these names come up. And she's like, well, you got to ask Billy because Billy, you know, has got all these stories. There's Andrea Buchanan who got murdered, actually. She got murdered. It was terrible it's when they discovered her in the morning. Well, you know Taylor Townsend, she's a Chicago kid. Uh, she's played. And then uh, Kyle Copeland. I, and you know about Kim Sands, right? Kim Sands. And do you know Kim? Oh, yeah, Kim Sands, yep. She yep. Was, she's a really yep. good player, really good coaching. She coached. She coached in Miami, I think, in Florida. And then Katrina Adams has done a great job, uh, you know, going from a career in tennis to being our first um, tour player as president of the USTA and black. Um, mm -hmm. so she's, she's had a great career. We've had a few, and if you look back at history before 1950, you have to go to the ATA because the American Tennis Association where all the black players are playing and you know, a lot of them are good enough to be playing on mm -hmm. the USTA circuit. I mean, there were two, there were two, um, sisters, but I think in the thirties, forties and fifties, was it, I think it was Matilda and, uh, let's see. Matilda and Margaret or something, they were sisters. Uh, and they played for 20, 30 years, but they would have been on the tour. Come on, all these players, it's, it's pathetic. <laughs> well, let me ask you, you've done all this, you've done all this, you've active been active and crazy. This is your first book, right? No, I've done other books, but not this one. This one's my, this is the definitive autobiography. This is, this is the one I've so, spent four so, years on. Oh my goodness. So I've heard numerous <laughs> stories uh what's in the book that i haven't heard what's in the book that, oh, like, no, the, you've, uh, well you've i talk held, about you've held inside well i talk a lot um uh there's a lot of warts in there there's a lot of tough stuff in there um very heart-wrenching for me to even discuss it eating disorders when i was outed uh it was terrible i lost everything overnight just about endorsement wise I had to start over um so well, just read it. But, you know, Lori McNeil's another great one. Um, she was a great player. You know, do you know that she beat Groff first round? And I called it on HBO. I said, I think she's going to win today because the grass, <laughs> the grass is slipperier and heavy. And she was a really good player, especially at that time. And she, uh, she's uh, upset. She upset um, Groff that day. I don't know what year it was, but it was, um, she was just, played unbelievably great grass court tennis, you know, cause she can chip, she can charge, chip. she can change it up. Bali. Yep, she can change it up. The grass was slippery. She handled the surface better and the golf was still young. How, how about Coco Golf the other day? That's great. Oh my goodness. You know, she, I mean, that's, she, she's on her way. She's, she's, she's a, a she good loves player. It. She's speaking out at a young age, which is she's a lot of pressure, great. but she's, she's stepping up, she's handling it. Yep. Uh, and she's backing it up with some wins. 
Uh, and I like it. I mean, her and Naomi, I think, are you know, just yeah, so outspoken, right? And yeah. remind me of sort of you, right? Not afraid to sort of put their reputations, their endorsements, their deals online. I think they, I think they know it helps them. Like it helps but, them to play yeah. with something. Other okay, than here, here's here's another thing that's completely the opposite. Now the people who endorse get behind it, promote it. That they used to go running the other way in the old days. Okay, so that's another great <laughs> thing that's changed that we have this platform and the players use it, but it enhances their life. It doesn't put them, like when we used to say things, we used to, oh man, it was rough. They People were not happy with us. People are very happy with this. I think they are, don't you? Yeah. You're right. Oh, well, yeah, we did not have that. We had the opposite response that the kids get today. And so I am so thrilled because that's another thing we wanted. We wanted them to be able to have a platform. It's a privilege to have a platform. Professional athletes have to understand the privilege that we have, the people that have championed us, the people. I mean, look at all the kids you've championed when I'm over excess with you and watch you or watch your other coaches. Or I love watch I love watching coaches because I think they're kind of like the un, unsung heroes, like teachers uh, are unsung. And but I know in my career there was Clyde Walker at the parks that changed my life and all Mr. Brennan and Merv Rose Darlene Hard helped me you know all these people help help me and champion me as as a human being and you know I, I think if each player would just kind of look back and start to realize that people did champion them they don't think so or they were against them but guess what when every time you walk into a tournament Every time you walk into, say, if you're on a team, whether in college or team or world team tennis or whatever, somebody had to put that on for you. That just didn't happen. Right. And I always and the I transport always, the food. They don't realize if so many people have gone out of their way for us. And I want players to start going back to that feeling a little bit because they're making a lot of money. They can do this. They can start noticing others around them, all the things they do. Like if you get in the car of transportation or whatever, somebody drives it, but somebody had to get that deal for the tournament. Oh, really? Oh yeah. I mean, the food, everything that we have and to have these opportunities, I just want them to take a beat for a minute and they get paid. We used to get $14. Yeah. We used to get per diem $14 a day. And if we stayed in the hotel, we got $28. So I just want the, I want the players to use the platform, to be appreciative, have gratitude. I think, do you think, don't you think the, the pandemic that has, has helped for gratitude or oh, not? Oh man, let me tell you. When, when, when we started up in tennis, I was in Charleston for the event they had. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, tennis without fans is not the same. It sure I mean, isn't. We need our fans. I mean, I was coaching and I was almost falling asleep and it was on clay. Right. So it was like, <laughs> we need our fans. And I, and, and I honestly, I, I, I hope that once the fans come back, that the players are more engaging, don't view it as such a chore to sign an autograph. Right. Maybe stop and take that selfie. Um, because That's at some privilege. point, you know, when you make a lot of money, the money doesn't become enough to keep you going. Right. And so if you're playing for something else other than the money, whether it's uh, you know, like Naomi, what she did at uh, U.S. Open, that wasn't about the money. That was about sending a message. Every win, she got a chance to sort of, you know, send a new message with a new name. I know. Um, it did, I think that that's what you do. I know. When she said, I've got seven masks, and, you know, you need seven, you need to win seven matches to win a, a major. I started laughing because she said this the first round. I think it was the yeah. first round. And I'm starting to yeah. laugh. I'm going, Whoa. She must think she's going to win. And she's got seven masks, and that means you've got to win seven matches. So I was cracking up. I said, I thought to myself, I wonder if she really knows what she said, because I don't know, people didn't seem to pick up on it that quickly. And I'm like, whoa, that's fantastic. She thinks she's going to win. I think Osaka's great. I think she thought that. Oh, I heard it. I, when she said that, I looked like, let me make sure she's not in our half, because she's on a mission. Right. I was like, let me make sure she, she's not And in she wants to win majors. Yeah, but she, she yeah. is a player, I think, who's been, you know, who thinks that you got to win the majors. And I just wish people would understand that we're taking tennis to the people in every tournament, every time you step on a court, that it's a privilege to have that opportunity. 
But I think it's important to take tennis to the people, not just play at majors. A lot of people can't afford to come to majors. So I think it's really, really oh, no, important yeah. to think about the little, the small tournaments to understand. Uh, okay, here's something I, I would love to have rookie school at the WTA. Um, maybe we'll do a rookie school through the ITF now because I want to help the kids be champions on and off the court. And now with right. virtual, the way we're using virtual and Zoom calls, on, I mean, it's fantastic. So I want to start getting the juniors um, organized around learning the history. But I, I want players to understand the business. They don't, how can you well, ask, think, how can you ask for more money if you don't understand the business? Well, I think that US, the WTA used to have like that sort of mentor program and it needs to come back we because did. I also think it keeps sort of the, the legends ingrained in the game, right? They'll sign somebody a mentor to help onboard them because, you know, being on tour is tough. I mean, traveling 38 weeks a year to foreign countries, you know, it's hard to have a relationship with a significant other. You're away from your family. You're traveling with a coach. You get tired of each other. Um, and you do need, whether it's a counselor, right, or a mental coach, or just someone that's been there to talk you through it. And I think from a historical factor, I think one of the things I know you would like is for them to be, to know more about your history, about the history of where the tour is, so that they can sort of adopt it and take it further. Well, they are right? history. And it, without the no, it's, I keep, program. But I keep trying to explain to them, you are history. Every day that goes by is history, it's living. It's not dead, it's living history. And how are you gonna shape the future? You guys, what do you want? For our sport, the more you read about history and the more you know, the more you know about yourself, but the most important aspect is you're able to shape the future. The reason I was able to do even what I did back in the old days is I love history. I knew all the champions, I'd read about it. And another thing that helped is Larry and I, my former husband and I actually owned tournaments with others because we didn't have a lot of money, but we, we were part owners. And that's when I really, really understood what it means to put a tournament on with my yeah, own, yeah. with some of our own money. Okay. And yeah. I, you know, but yeah. if, if I wish more players own tournaments, I wish they were more involved. We're going to have tournaments here this summer. And for the first time since 1994, really? Le In Leslie was the last black female. Yeah. We're having Great. a few tournaments this summer. Are you going to do it at this? Are you gonna, oh, great. Yeah, and for the first time since 1994, we'll have a black female tournament director. Leslie Allen was the last black female tournament director in 1994 in Virginia. And who's gonna be the one this year? Zena Garrison. All right. Chanda yeah. Rubin. Who? Right. Chanda Rubin. Chanda Rubin. Oh, that's, oh, Chanda, we should have talked about her. She's great and she's doing a great job with their, you know, game set chat. I love, I just love them. Oh God, Chanda is fantastic. And she's gotten a lot better. There's another announcer who's getting better and better and better every day. So, uh, and then the, Zena, oh, I love Zena. I love these guys. They, they make me laugh. <laughs> Zena is like, she, I consider her one of my dearest friends and Chanda's getting closer because I've got to spend a little more time with her. But Chanda was yeah, also yeah. on the Fed Cup team. So uh, she was, she's, She's really smart and really wonderful. And well, people don't know like Chanda was six in the world. I think she got as high as six. No, she's, in the world. I think she's I mean, a little Chanda higher. Used to be... I think she was a little higher. I think she was four yeah. or five. Four? Four, four or four. five, maybe. Chanda I don't know. I think little... a little higher than six. I used to know exactly. She was a baller. What? Yeah. She was, no, she was a baller. I mean, she, uh, she was a play. great player. Oh, no. Chanda's a great player. I, I don't think uh, people appreciate her enough. Obviously, I, I didn't, I wasn't computing for a second, but. Um, Zena took a long time for us to become friends because every time I'd go by her, I go, hi, Zena, and she'd go, hi. And then she'd keep going and i go. Finally, one time at the International Tennis Hall of Fame, I, she's at the net and I walk up to the net and say, okay, this has to stop. I've been saying hi to you for 10 years. <laughs> and we just have a little more discussion. I said, and she and I started laughing and then that kind of broke the ice. But I mean, I was trying to be really thoughtful of her space God, I didn't know what to do. I was just like, but she is Oh, well such now, a she just goes now. Now she has something to say. She can't hold it in. Back when we were coaching together, it'd be before the match, um, and she'd want to get some off her chest, and I'd say, Zena, not now. Let's just wait till after the match, right? The win is more important than anything, right? You can just get over it. Just go have a, drink, a sip of coffee or something. Calm down. She said, no, I can't let it go. I, 
And so now she's like in your face right away. I always say, Zena, I'm gonna tell you something, but don't say anything. Never works. She can't hold it in. She just gotta go. And she's great. So she's, she's come a long way. Changed be, now. Yeah, but she used to be so shy. So I, 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 I'm thrilled with what I've seen uh, with it, with the, a lot of the players, and they're just so nice. They're really great. They're great people. They're great people, and that's the ones I always want to win. If I, if somebody's not a nice person, I'd go. Eh, I don't care if they win, but I really care when someone, ah. you know, when someone's like, eh. I like, I like, I don't know. I, and of course, if I don't know them, I go, you know what? I don't really know them. So I have to give them a chance. And it's better to be kind and good anyway. It's just better. You know, it's like. Well, I'll, I'll ask you the one last question before I let you go. I know Alana's probably behind the screen. Like, come oh, no, you gotta go. We gotta go. Easton. No, she actually isn't. She's been good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, it's like I'm getting though? dark or something. What? The, the sun's coming down in New York, it's, right? No, it's not dark there. I hope we're not losing our uh, power here. Go ahead. Oh, no. Who's your favorite male player and favorite female player right now? Who's the one when the draw comes out that you root for? I would never do that. I don't, I'm, I'm not like that at all. No, I, I oh, always, Billy. I think about all have the, a favorite. I don't actually, I do not have a favorite. My favorite, I, I, I think of myself as, um, that I can't do that. That's not the right thing to do in my position. And also, I what I really love, if you if you name each person, I'll tell you who I admire a lot is Rublev. I know that guy loves tennis. I love it when I see a player love the sport. And he loves it. I Don't you think he's unbelievable? He's, you know what? He's oh, tiny. He's, he's not very big. I mean, he's pretty tall, I guess. But he's thin. And, you know, some of the other guys are thicker and stronger and all But he is so wiry and strong, but there's like a little kid out where I go to uh, like at John McEnroe's place in New York. And I look at, there's this little kid and I see Patrick a lot too, but there's this little kid that reminds me of Rublev. He's about eight years old. He's got these little skinny legs, but he hits so hard and he just loves it. He looks to me and I go, oh, you're, you're Rublev Jr. I call him. I don't even know the kid's name yet. I've only seen him a couple of times, but he reminds me so much of him. I love players like I just love players that love it. But you know what? The top players love, look at Federer, Nadal, Joker, they all love it. I love it. And then the top women, it's just and the women's strength, the women's depth is just amazing now. I women's sports has always been in its in infancy, but man, tennis yeah. is starting to look really deep now. Just really deep. And the matches are so good and so close. And you never know who's gonna win. So I'll say my favorite male, the one I always root for, until he retires, I'll always root for him, is Monfils. Oh, I'll never forget so that match fun. against Federer in the French Open. He won a semis, match. Semis, he won a match, right? Yeah, we watched but the semis, it. I never forget. Yeah, the semis of for the him, French Open fun. against Federer. Yeah, we're, when he played Federer in the semis of the French Open years ago, I thought that would have been like the turning point in his career, like six match points. And just couldn't finish. That's too bad. But he's like my all-time favorite. I always root for him. Wait, look. And then female player, I always root for the girl I'm coaching. So my <laughs> favorite female player is the one is the one I'm coaching at the time. You like you like mom so, He's tall and skinny like you. <laughs> oh, tall and skinny. And you know, he's just he's like a guy's guy. It's like practice, practice is fun. It's not all this pressure. It's not this awkward. Sometimes you get you get the girls on the court practicing. And there's like this weird, awkward silence. Really? In my mind, I'm thinking, we're just practicing. Play a practice set. Let's just practice our stuff. It's okay. We're not we so, have to sit so far but, away from each other. Yeah, but Kamal, you got to understand, girls aren't socialized as well as boys, uh, as far as this situation. In other ways, we're socialized better. But not in this. We're not socialized well at all. So that's a whole yeah, other so I, I don't like that, the way we're that socialized. Was, yeah, that's hard for me. You know, most of the time we pray, you know, you show up at the slam, you get there a week early, you play five or six practice sets against five different girls, and everyone's the same. No one speaks. No one, like, that's next to each other. Really? There's awkward silence. Well, that's kind of like, hey, we're just practicing, guys. It doesn't count yet. It doesn't count till Monday. We're just practicing. Let's just have fun and crack a few jokes. Well, our, like, our, no, our, time. Our, <laughs> generation, our generation, we couldn't afford coaches, so we, we coached each other, actually and tried to help each other because, and we were like family. And you know what? You can never take that experience away from the older players. That's the one thing Chris Everett 
comes up and always says, you know what? I'll never trade our days for what the players have today because we were like family. And, you know, Chris and Martina, I mean, without them, I don't know where women's tennis would be because they were really the first generation of pros and they gave up a lot. You know, they talk about their 18 singles majors. They would have both had, they both would have broken Margaret's record. Um, but, but they also played the Virginia Slims of San Francisco during the, during uh, the Australian. They played a lot of team tennis during the French. So you know what, mm -hmm. you know what, we're trying to get tennis to be pro, get more jobs, take tennis to the people, uh, all those things. So it was great. Well, thank you, Billy. I thank you for your time. I love you. Love you too. Say Always hi to Jen and the baby. chatting with you. I'll say hi to Jen and the kids. And I'll um, say I remember I, I got to tell the story. I got to, when we first got acquainted, you always would call me after midnight. Always, never, it was never daylight. I never spoke. No, and I always text it you. Was always like, I always text you. Like, Are you still awake? Are you still awake? I'm awake. So my phone would ring. And every married man knows, like, when your phone rings at midnight, your wife is like rolling over, like, who's that? So he's <laughs> like, Billy, Billy, Billy. And I think, you know, your phone, and your name on my phone was Billy. It wasn't like, you know, Billie Jean King or BJK. So I about it the fifth time. She says, who is this girl you keep talking to at midnight? <laughs> and I was like, my name is Billy, and she don't want nothing I got. So it's OK. <laughs> right? Anyway, it's great. Who is this? Anyway, say hi to Jen. <laughs> Tell her it's from BJK. I will. It was great to see you. Hugs and kisses the family. Hi, Lana. Love you. All right. Is this you your first soon. show? Thanks for being on. This is, is my it? first show. Oh, Maybe wow. This, this is like great. I didn't know that. Anyway, oh, yeah. thank you. You're the first. I had to start off with you. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. It's really nice of you. But uh, <laughs> good luck with everything. I love your announcing. I love your coaching. You know what I do. You know I love you. So anyway, take care and say hi to Jen and the kids. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you, Billy. Talk to you Thanks soon. a lot, Kamal. Bye. Bye. Bye.